when Marcus Antonius returned to Rome following Caesar's victory at the Battle of Pharsalus, few were willing to believe Pompeius Magnus had been defeated. When Caesar crossed the Rubicon, tearing his way through Italy, many statues of Pompeius Magnus had been taken down and replaced with statues of Caesar. When news reached the city of Caesar's defeat at Dyrrachium, however, Caesar's statues were removed, and those of Pompeius Magnus were returned to their plinths. With knowledge of the sheer size of the Pompeian army widely circulated, Antonius's claims of a sudden Caesarian victory seemed unbelievable, especially given both Caesar and Pompeius were absent from the city. It was not until Pompeius's signet ring arrived from Alexandria that the Roman people accepted the death of their once beloved general. But the war was not over. With praise and honor being heaped upon Caesar, Antonius used the pro Caesarian Senate to label Marcus Porcius Cato, Metellus Scipio, and Titus Labienus as conspirators who threatened the safety of the Republic. No longer operating under the leadership of a commander, they were now considered insurgents engaged in raising forces without senatorial sanction, with intent to terrorize Rome and overthrow the government. Because Cato, Scipio, and Labienus were now viewed as posing a threat, and because most of the Senate had quickly become Caesarian partisans following the Battle of Pharsalus, Gaius Julius Caesar was pronounced dictator of Rome for a second time. Instead of the standard six-month term, the Senate granted Caesar a full year to deal with the last of the Pompeians. As his magister equitum, or master of the horse, Caesar appointed Marcus Antonius. The holder of the office of Magister Equitum served as a lieutenant to the dictator. Given imperium equaling that of a praetor, Marcus Antonius, as Magister Equitum, was subject to the imperium of the dictator, and even of the consuls, but outranked all lower offices. In the absence of the dictator, however, the Magister Equitum was granted the authority of the dictator in Rome, and so, while Caesar remained in Alexandria indefinitely, Marcus Antonius, who was granted six lictors to guard his person, assumed Caesar's dictatorial powers within the city. But the Senate was unhappy with Caesar's choice of Marcus Antonius as master of the horse. It was one thing to name as dictator a man who had pardoned most of his enemies, and who had not employed the use of bloody prescriptions to rob Rome's nobility of life and wealth, but for that deserving man to transfer his power to one who had proven no such strength of character more than frightened the Senate. Marcus Antonius's first order of business was to oversee the 47 BC elections. Owing to Caesar's influence, Quintus Fufius Calanus and Publius Vatinius were elected consuls. Calanus was one of the ship captains who had sailed with Marcus Antonius from Brundisium to Nymphaeum in their attempt to reunite the split forces of Caesar before the Battle of Dyrrachium. Publius Vatinius, who was married to Marcus Antonius's sister, Antonia, had served as tribune of the plebs during Caesar's 59 BC consulship, and was the author of the Lex Vatinia, which had granted Caesar the two proconsular provinces of Illyricum and Cisalpine Gaul, the Senate later adding the third province of Transalpine Gaul. In addition to the consuls, the offices of tribunes of the plebs went to Gaius Asinius Pollio and Publius Cornelius Dolabella, both men who enjoyed Caesar's support. Gaius Asinius Pollio was one of the very few men to cut his way out and escape Africa alive when Gaius Scribonius Curio lost three legions to the forces of King Juba at the Battle of Bagrada's River. Publius Cornelius Dolabella had marched with Caesar to Hispania, and had served with him up to the Battle of Pharsalus. A fire in 50 BC caused a shortage of housing in Rome, exacerbated by an earthquake which hit the city in 49 BC, the same year Caesar crossed the Rubicon, beginning armed conflict against the Pompeians. Fire, earthquake, and the cost of civil war soon drove debt to a level that affected nearly every social strata within Rome. Tenements that had suffered destruction were only partially rebuilt, at great cost, then were rented out at extortionate prices so that the developers could recoup their financial losses. The cost of living was rising exponentially, forcing the people to turn to moneylenders just to survive. In 49 BC, before leaving for Hispania, Caesar had passed the Lex Iulia de Pecuniis Mutuis, which provided that property assessed at pre-civil war value could be traded to debtors in lieu of cash payments. 
While this law protected indebted citizens from having their land confiscated and sold at auction prices, preventing their families from being sold into debt bondage, it was of little use to Rome's urban poor, who owned nothing of value. Almost immediately into the 47 BC year, Dolabella, who had amassed huge personal debts, attempted to enlist the support of Antonius for legislation which would abolish debt in Rome, thus following in the footsteps of Marcus Caelius Rufus. The patricians and wealthy equites, who held most of the city's debts, fought against Dolabella's bill and, believing that Dolabella and Antonius were plotting together, they attempted, unsuccessfully, to have Marcus Antonius legally removed as magister equitum. Gaius Asinius Pollio and another tribune of the plebs, named Lucius Trebellius Fidus, convinced Antonius that Caesar would not support such reckless legislation. Additionally, we are told that Marcus Antonius discovered Dolabella was having an affair with his wife, Antonia Hybrida. Divorcing Antonia, Antonius, acting as Magister Equitum, blocked Dolabella's motion. Like Marcus Caelius Rufus before him, Dolabella began giving rousing speeches throughout the city, drawing larger and larger crowds who were eager to have their debts cancelled. Hoping to force the Senate and Marcus Antonius to meet his legislative demands, Dolabella led his massive following to occupy the Forum Romanum in protest. With the Forum Romanum under occupation by the people, the city fell into anarchy. Armed gangs soon roamed the Forum Romanum, attacking anyone they deemed their enemy. Any wealthy Roman was fair game for the mob, which made the aristocracy afraid to leave the safety of their villas. Meeting in a secret location, the Senate, under the protection of armed guards, passed a Senatus Consultum Ultimum, charging Marcus Antonius, in his capacity as Magister Equitum, to save the Republic. Though Antonius had been given orders by Caesar to maintain control of Rome's political situation, it had plunged into anarchy under his watch. So Antonius acted, marching his legions from the Campus Martius and across the Pomerium. Descending into the Forum Romanum, a battle ensued. Though Antonius lost some of his men, hundreds of Rome's urban poor were cut down by his trained soldiers. Publius Cornelius Dolabella was not killed during the violence. Though we don't know for certain how he escaped Antonius, it seems likely that he fled to his father-in-law, Cicero, in Brundisium. After Pompeius's defeat at Pharsalus, command of the Pompeian armies was offered to Cicero, who was the highest-ranking military officer on hand, still holding the imperium from his Cilician pro-consulship. Cicero declined the offer. He had always known a military dictatorship would follow whichever side won the civil war. Cicero had chosen Pompeius because a Pompeian dictatorship would at least have offered the illusion of senatorial support. Now it was time to make amends and seek peace with Caesar, then discover for himself whether the Senate still had a future in Caesar's Rome. But upon landing at Brundisium, Cicero received a dispatch from Marcus Antonius, warning the orator that his safety could not be guaranteed, should he come to Rome. From Brundisium, Cicero kept abreast of events in Rome through various letters exchanged with friends and relatives. In the absence of any word from Caesar, Rome's acting dictator, Marcus Antonius, following the killing of Roman citizens in the Forum Romanum, yoked lions to a chariot and rode around the city streets like a triumphing general, alongside a well-known actress and dancer named Volumnia Sathiris, with whom he was having an affair. As Magister Equitum, with six lictors to precede him, Antonius also decided it was now time to live in a location more appropriate to his exalted title. Although Caesar had rigorously avoided using the proscription methods which had defined the dictatorship of Lucius Cornelius Sulla, and had resulted in the families of his political opponents being stripped of their wealth, homes, and lives, Marcus Antonius, as the most powerful man in Rome, thought nothing of claiming for himself the home of the late Pompeius Magnus on Palatine Hill, which he immediately embellished with high-end renovations. Rome's Senate, even those who had supported Caesar only as a matter of survival following the fall of Pompeius Magnus, all now held their breath, anxiously awaiting the return of Rome's real dictator, Julius Caesar. 